All right, welcome to the September 3rd, 2024 Aries Cloud Asian Python user group community meeting, ACAPUG. Um, we've got a few things to discuss. The ACAPI move to OWF, um, the proposal for that, um, what to do about deprecation messages. We've had some back and forth on that on a pull request, and then adding did TDW support, which I didn't get enough chance to read, but I did some this morning and we can start to chat through that. Um, reminder, this is a Linux Foundation, Hyperledger Foundation meeting. So the uh, Linux Foundation antitrust policy is in effect, as is the Hyperledger Code of Conduct. Please follow both of those requirements. Um, we are recording and the recording will be posted after this. I noticed that the 20th meeting from two weeks ago hasn't been posted yet. Not quite sure why that is, so I'll be following up on that um, today. Um, so these, this is the agenda. If anyone wants to, A, introduce themselves or add any topics to the agenda or any other announcements, please do so now. Jump up to the microphone. Right. Okay, um, status updates. Um, I have been putting together and sharing in the community um, the um, proposals for moving parts of Aries to the Open Wallet Foundation. So um, there's a proposal for Akapai, Asgar, Aries Agent Test Harness, Aries mediator service, and then the creation of a special interest wallet interoperability group. So um, there is a link in the meeting agenda. I can post it. I might as well post it to the chat. So if anyone wants to look at it. Um, um, they're there. Uh, but they basically are all in the format that the OWF requests for this. These will be turned in to um, uh, PRs probably later today. So if you do have comments, get them in quickly. Um, but this is the proposal for Akapai itself here, um, suggesting that it go in as a... Um, uh, a uh, impact project, which is the the high um, the highest level of um, project, most mature project at OWF. I get confused. There's a growth and an impact, and it seems obvious when you say them together, but I still struggle with it a bit. So anyway, if this is an impact one. I hope is what we're proposing overview of it, um, alignment with the mission, and then um, source control. Um, I was putting in the series of projects that would go with it. So there's Akapai, Akapai plugins, Akapai tools, Akapai controllers. So I think we're all familiar with those. BC Gov has long maintained VC Auth N, Open ID Connect. And so we're proposing moving that from BC Gov to um, into um, OWF as well, and then Aries Accreta. Um, so those are the ones that we're proposing. Um, we've got a list of maintainers and so on, governance um and that and then um as i say there is similar proposals for ascar for aries agent test harness aries mediator service and then the sig itself um so each of those are in here if anyone wants to go through those make comments suggestions improvements um uh, please do so um so i will as i say be putting those in pretty quickly. Um, I realize um, I don't have a, um, a TAC sponsor. TAC is in the OWF organization. Um, I don't have a sponsor for that. So I'll, I'll have to check in with um, Tracy Kurt on, on suggestions on that. 
I don't know who exactly is on the tack at um, Open Wallet Foundation. That's the, I don't know what the A means. Um, technical something committee. Um, in Hyperledger, it's been technical oversight committee. I don't know what it is at uh, OWF. Any comments or questions on that? Uh, actually, let's go to PRs. It's easy to jump between them. So um, this issue came up, um, came in as, as an issue of a noisy log at the startup. There's multiple banner messages. Um, so there's two comments in here. And, and I don't really have the answer to the second one, so I wanted to start with that one. Um, should the messages be print statements or log statements? I want them as in your face as possible. Um, should they be logs or print statements? Does, is, is there a Python um, etiquette on that? Is there a, is there a server etiquette? for the type of project that Akapai is um, that dictates whether it should be print or banner messages. Oh. Any comments on that from anyone? Wait. I think that um, it came down more to the formatting of the messages. I, I believe uh, Daniel and, and possibly Jamie uh, weighed in on that. Um, I think if it was done as log messages, you'd end up with the timestamps and everything, and it would start getting a little bit messy where using the print statements, it formats the notifications better. So do we just dismiss this one? the logging versus print? I kind of felt that he was just trying to do something kind of weird and it was messing with his, like he wanted, he was getting errors on startup and then the print statements were just making it harder for him to debug, but it kind of seemed like a pretty niche thing that he was doing. Okay. But that's how I felt about it. It was like, get over it. But um, I didn't. I didn't really feel like this was an actual problem. Okay, so the print statements instead of logging, that's okay. My my overall comment about this is, I don't think it's a good idea to suppress. Um, well, let's hold off on that one. Okay. okay, we'll take that one separately. This one, okay. I just wanted to hit the print versus logging. For sure. Um, yeah. I, I think that really comes down to, to the formatting. Um, with the deprecation messages and the warning messages, you want them to be very clear and you don't want them to be cluttered with any like time stamping or date stamping. Okay. Um, so I think when we're talking about logging versus printing, it really depends on the format, the formatting that you want the, the text to come out. Okay. Um, under the particular conditions. Okay. I'm just trying to go ahead. It would also be notable to, to say that like literally nothing else is printed to standard out. I think like all the logging will go to standard air. Um, and that's where pretty much everything else that's interesting about the actual operation of Akapai is going to be located anyways. Um, so in terms of like, being able to filter out important messages, I think all of them are already going to be on standard air rather than standard out. And so if you filtered standard out, you'd filter out the deprecation warnings there and you get just your logs. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, thanks. Sorry, I was taking notes um, as we were doing that, so I would have things to respond to this with. Okay, so that's that one. Now we get to the suppression of the banner message. So I'm, and I think Wade, what you were about to say, and uh, is just yeah. Okay. My my opinion on that one is yeah. I I don't think it's a good idea to um, suppress the messages. I do think that the messages should be done in the con like done in the context of the setup. So there seems to be, and I, I I could be wrong here, but in most cases the deprecation warnings are based on somebody having the configuration set up so that they're using something that's deprecated. That makes total sense. Have have the message going. Hey, you're using something that's completely deprecated. Please move to such and such and the way to get rid of that banner message is to migrate to that that new that new supported uh, feature and away from the deprecated one. I think there might be some warnings in there that it might be a little bit more difficult to do that with um, that are coming up just as default. Mm -hmm. um, so there might not be a way currently to um, make those particular messages go away yeah so there's a couple of things here so one is the confusion on his part so i don't know if people have followed all this but he's he was saying that this message is saying you've got to move away from did solve and you can't do that because did indy's not fully supported yet or something like that um this message is saying um use didcom.org as the prefix for messages. <laughs> so totally different from did support and all that stuff. So first of all, his interpretation wasn't quite right. So that's that's okay. Um, but to what Wade was saying, this is messages saying, hey, um, you've switched over to using always sending this, but if you ever receive any, you should tell them not to. And, and the problem with that is um, they they can't do that. Uh, like that depends on what other people do. So there's no way to look in the configuration settings or whatever to turn this message off. It's intended to say, hey, let other people know not to do that, which is uh, you, was useful at the time, but um, so I think we just remove this one is my suggestion. So that one is is kind of a let's handle it separately. But the other is we do what Wade talked about, which is deprecate messages that should provide how you how you remove it. So they only show up if you are using an old feature, if we can do that. And B, include here's how you get rid of it. So just some guidance on how we construct those messages. Does that make sense? So I, I, I generally think what you're proposing is a good idea. Um, having the, the deprecation notices appear when they're relevant is better than them being present all the time. I, I think that makes okay. sense. Yeah. Um, I think there is definitely a challenge with detecting when deprecated features are being used. Exactly. Uh, yes. For example, the connection protocol is considered deprecated, but it's it's active by default because that's how yep. it's always been. Yep. So if we if we like move that to being behind like a flag, then it would be easy to detect that, but then that would be like a a, a breaking change on like configuration if they were using the connections protocol, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and would also mean additional flags on startup. Yeah, uh, but but maybe it's a maybe it's not a bad idea to have like deprecated features be like explicitly opt in at the point of deprecation, um, so they they don't just continue using deprecated things and ignoring log messages and and deprecation notices and everything, and then all of a sudden it's gone and now they're right. upset. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So. To me, this out and out way of, oh, just ignore all deprecation messages, that that's a complete non-starter for me because then you never see future deprecation messages. Um, in theory, we could have a, a one that says, 
don't show deprecation message three <laughs> or whatever. Um, but well, and uh, to contrast something that Daniel mentioned where you have a flag and that would be a breaking change, uh, one option would be to have a inverse flag where connections is still enabled by default, but if you add the flag disable connections, it'll disable the connections protocol and remove the warning. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And and that is a matter of all of those are are um specific, you know, instance specific. And we would just say, here's how deprecation messages are intended to be used. Um, when you build a new one, here's the things to think about as you add it. <laughs> but that's about it. And you can add new configuration options to suppress the message if you followed through with it, just as you, as Colton said. Sound about right? Do we agree that this one can be deleted? I'm fine with that. Um, I noted in here that I did look up. Um, so we've had the ability not to use that one since 5.5 and since 11. Um, anyone using 11 and later cannot send out did sobs. So I think we're okay to remove it. And I don't even, yeah, I'm not even sure what you could do um, in detecting these. <laughs> Actually, the biggest problem is right now they're used in the, uh, might be used in the Aries test harness. I don't know. I guess not because the Aries test harness would be using 11 or later. So it probably isn't in Akapai, at least, sending those out. OK. Any other thoughts on this one? All right. Um, let's go to PRs first. See if there's anything um, there. Um, nightly and release workloads, we've got a review required. Jamie, you want to briefly go over this one? Yeah, I tagged a couple of people on it. But it for people that don't know, we have changed the integration testing. So we're using AATH and the existing, a subset of the existing integration tests. Uh, the Gherkin ones. And then we also have this new scenario testing, which is using the Indicio library. So we have three sets of tests, but this one just uh, changes the ones that run nightly and what runs on PRs. So um, yeah, it's not too complicated, but it just detects if there's, if it's a release or a nightly build and stuff and runs different subset of tests. So it will run quite a few on nightly. And then for a release, it's basically running everything. Mm -hmm. And then on PRs, it's just running a subset. So it's, it's not too complicated. It'll just make it so. Right now, okay. the nightly is just the same as it was before. So this just changes it to use the AATH and run the scenario tests on the nightly and stuff like that. Yeah. I think that one should be good to go. <laughs> okay. Um, this was that kind of a... Go ahead. I was going to ask if that uh, increased your uh, your test cycle time by removing some integration tests and adding the AATH stuff in, or is it does it it's a, take longer? It's now? actually less because we're just running uh, the critical tag on PRs, and then um, for the nightly, it's. A, uh, we're running the acceptance test, but we're 
still running less of our own integration tests. For the release one, that's the last one is like, that one's increased by quite a bit because it's running all the all the tests basically. But for PRs, it's actually less time than it was before. So, um, and nightly is a little bit less than it was before too. So. Cool, interesting. What's the process yeah, we, look like for for catching like errors on the release workflow? Out of curiosity, like if if we do discover that there's issues with the release, um, like does it just fail to publish the release, or or like what options are there, or or is it that it's triggered on a PR that is meant to publish a release? No, it's like when Stephen increases the version. It will just run all the tests. So um, I guess technically he could, I think he could still merge that and then the publish would happen, but the, all the tests would, the tests would fail when he creates that uh, PR that increases the version of Akapai's. Okay, gotcha. And then we'll see it failed and then we can look and... There's still one uh, one for endorsement that fails on a regular basis that I want to look at. There's like one test that fails on a regular basis. But, but yeah, we can look at the logs and see if it's like just that one or. Yeah. Okay. So, so to just to, to clarify in fewer words, uh, when you say release workflow, it's not like the, it's not a workflow triggered by a release. It's a workflow triggered by a PR that's preparing for a release. Yeah, it's a PR that increases the version in the Pi project. Okay. Uh, cool. file. That's yeah. good. That's a good place to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so modify count start query parameters to be integers, not strings. Breaking change question. Um, this is a breaking change. I'm not quite, it's a very minor um breaking change what do we do what do we do with this one um i don't think anyone's using this or very few this is a, a new feature correct this is the one that um uh marit's added relatively recently right yeah so uh, i'm a bit confused because there are some old endpoints that have a start and count query param, but I don't think they worked. Okay. Or they or they worked, but they he's doing so, something with the ask our wallet. So it's actually limiting uh before. So like before it was getting a huge payload back and then filtering it. Mm -hmm. So I guess this still did work, but it just wasn't efficient at all. So Anyway, it's good work that he's doing, but yeah, there's these other endpoints that had different, that were called start and count, and they're gonna get changed to uh, limit and offset, which is, I think is the standard. Yeah. And that's what he's changing all these other ones to. So yeah. those endpoints have a change in query parameters. So th that is a breaking change if you're using those endpoints. Okay. All but right, it was well, more just a question of what we're doing. Like, are like some projects increase the middle version or whatever you want to call yeah, it? Yeah, I, I would think this would be a middle version one. Change. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to do like a major versions every time there's like a tiny exactly. Yeah. Change. Yep. Like... Okay. So I don't know if that's uh, I just don't know if that's described in the release documentation. Okay. Like that there could possibly be breaking changes for the middle version. And the other way to handle that is to continue to accept start and count. Or but yeah, I, or the new ones have yeah. all start and count, but. Yeah. Oh, if there's new ones, they wouldn't need it. But if there's an existing one that uses start and count, we add the other one as well and say, don't use this start and count. Yeah, they should just all be consistent. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I think that's what he's saying here. Okay. Yeah. I'll try a response to that. And then the others we've talked about in the past, these just need to move forward. Obviously, none of them are, are ready to go yet. Um, I do want to know, uh, and I'll probably push um, or uh, talk to Patrick since he probably knows best what to do with this one, this did web support. And maybe it folds into, um, well, this is only for JSON LD proof presentation. So I'll probably let, uh, talk to Patrick about that one. Okay. Um, next up is um, let's get to the did TDW. So I read through it this morning. So there's a draft proposal, uh, or sorry, design notes um, from Daniel that are here. Um, I read through it uh, this morning. That's all before this meeting. So in the last half hour, so I did not add a little. Um, Daniel, I did add to the goals these. So I guess we can start with that. So the idea here, context, is we want to add support for did TDW. Um, in that, we want ledger and non-ledger based decentralized identity solutions. We want to be able to um, publish a non-creds with um, did TDW and how we treat that. Um, uh, continue to eliminate Indyisms that have persisted in the code base beyond their usefulness. So, uh, again, this uh, ledger agnostic, if you will, or, or um, did did agnostic uh, mechanisms in the code base. So we want to continue with that. So, um, creation of did TDW did. So the things Daniel only had this, including a convention as to where dids are published pattern to follow for other did methods. So that speaks to the, um, how do we make it easier for new dids to be added? We've talked about the fact that for a registrar, we don't want to have a completely generic um, um, interface for that, that it could be did specific and that's okay. Um, but we should have a way that says, okay, if you're adding it, here's the mechanism you use to add it. Um, did TDW has two types of keys, and I think we have to support that. Um, so there's keys that authorize updates to the did TDW did, and then there's keys that are used by the did that are that go into the did doc. Um, while a did TDW authorization key can also go in the did doc. It can also, you, you would use separate ones for that as well. Um, I think we want to do both of those, uh, allow the keys for updates to the did to be separate from the dids in the did doc. Does that, A, that question make sense and and any comments on that thoughts off the, off the bat or do you want to think about it? Um. I think we need to pick one or the other and probably stick with that. Um, and, and just in the interest of keeping it simple for creation of did TDW by a controller. Uh, so if they want to create a did TDW, they, they can just hit an endpoint. They don't have to worry about the minutia of where the keys are and what keys are being created. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should, as I said, Pick one pattern, stick to it. And I think the pattern that I'm leaning towards would be having a separate set of keys for authorizing updates than what are contained within the did document, just to keep yeah. things very neatly differentiated between them, I guess. Yeah. OK. Um, future is managing key rotation. Um, that one is interesting. The The idea of putting both the active key and the pre-rotation key into Akapai means that if you break into Akapai or, or its storage, you have both keys. 
And so there is some some discussion in the did TDW implementation guide about keeping those separate. Um, I don't think we need to worry about that. I think that's um, can be managed in the implementation in the future. So I've got that as a future done. Um, On issuance, I added a note that um, including publishing of an on-credits objects using the mechanisms defined in the Python trusted web implementation. So there is um, in that um, a sample and on-credits and a method for publishing them. Um, so that's to be done. That, that gives us at least something to use as the basis. Andrew's done some thoughts of how to do that. What it essentially comes down to is um, a each of the documents contains a W3C verifiable credential with the credential subject being the object in here. So, um, so you create a cred def and then you publish it as a um, W3C verifiable credential that gives you validity that the intended intended party published it um, they published it as a as a verifiable credential and then um, in resolving it you verify the vc and then extract the data you're going to use for it so that work has been done um, i believe he did it as a hash link as well so in in um in some of the implementation, he's got a hash link for the an on creds object. And I think that's what you might be seeing here is this is the hash link um, for it. Patrick, oh, you're here. I, I came in right at the, the good time. This was uh, interesting to see. I'm assuming you're presenting how to uh, publish an on creds object on a trusted web server with yeah. a proof attached. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Th this is interesting, and it's similar. So I'm I'm currently working like on a did web server uh, that has the same kind of idea. Like when you want to publish a did document, uh, you sign the did document with some proof. And I, I was thinking like, why not just use the same mechanism when you want to publish anything on that server? Yeah. Uh, I I had also in mind like status lists, uh, an on creds object, and any file, you know, like, uh, so, so I, I really like this and the proof configuration that you show this uh, exactly aligned with what I'm working on. And uh, if there's some time uh, left, I can present how I foresee endorsement happening for this. Okay. Um, yeah, but this, this is cool. Okay, I'm not quite sure what this object is, so... Um... This is the context. Oh, this is this what's going to define. I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, I think context. having a, yeah. an on cred context, I know there was discussion around not needing it for the VCDM stuff, but I think it's, it's still a good thing that should be made. Um, uh, if you will, this is a different context <laughs> for the context. Um, and I think it definitely makes sense for this, for these objects to have a context. So, yeah. Yeah. The yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, yeah, I know. So it's not a context for the actual anon creds issued, exactly. but for the anon creds object. Exactly. But yeah, I, th I think still the anon creds context to, to define anon creds stuff is a uh, is great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that gets into um, a section that I added to your document, Daniel, called publishing. Um, and that is that while we've got creation of the did TDW, we also have publishing, which is analogous to in indie, we create, you know, the various objects and then we publish them to the uh, an indie ledger. Here we're going to publish them to a likely a did TDW server, um, much as um, Patrick was talking about. And so we've got the separation of the did TDW, the the did handling within Akapai and the publishing of the dids to some other entity. And it should be just an HTTP call to publish it, I would assume. And then future and endorser concept is part of that. So 
The endorser, I suspect, would be likely transparent to the ACAPI. Basically, the ACAPI would say, hey, publish this to this DDW, D, D, TDW server that manages the um, namespace of, of the DTW, and the DTW might return back a, no, I'm not going to do it for you. And so that makes it essentially um, um, blocked. That might be sufficient. Patrick? Yeah, I, my idea for the endorser was, um, so I hinted at that, was to create a didcom protocol, like a data integrity proof didcom protocol uh, mm -hmm. about just adding a proof to a document. Uh, so that could be a way uh, that's very similar to the current endorsement that the agent signs the credential they want to issue, and then they send that signed credential to the endorser to get either a proof chain or a proof set. Um, mm -hmm. and then that endorser needs to be an endorser that the trusted web server understand. And my okay. kind of idea that I could share is, is that the root did of the tr trusted web server is the endorser did, um, the keys are managed somewhere else. But so if you have like trust.gov.bc as your trusted web server, well, trust.gov.bc is the endorser did. And then like the path identified dids or like client dids, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, I think the simplicity of that, we can get to it. Um, Non-goals, I agree, pre-rotation witnesses is um, future. Um, who is might also be future because we really don't have, we don't know how that's going to be used yet. Um, and so that might be a future. Um, definitely resolving of an on-prez objects, um, we definitely want to be able to do. And then... I have not had a chance to go through this at all, so I don't have anything to add. Um, Daniel, do you want to say any comments on these? I'm sort of putting you on the spot. Uh, let's see. So I think the big idea is below the point uh, in the proposed technical solution. Um, the big ideas are uh, those feature flags for did creation to just make yes. it easy for the controller. Um, yeah. And That's then the other one is uh, I did some analysis of the usage of the concept of a quote unquote ver key within the Occupy code base. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I haven't really narrowed it down exactly to a proposed technical solution based on that analysis yet. Mostly just identified where it's being used and how it's being used in those contexts. Okay. Uh, yeah, for instance, ver key is, is used explicitly for packing and unpacking, uh, but it's not an integral piece of like our, our inbound message to connection lookup process or in our outbound messaging. That whole process is also independent of, of like using the very key value. Um, yeah, so uh, there's there's more evaluation that needs to be done on, on this particular point. But yeah, that's that's kind okay. of the two big things that are in the rest of this document right now. So the big thing you're saying there is that there's places where we are referencing bear keys that are parts of DIDs and, and figuring out the, right. the difference between those. Right, we've got yeah. um, we've got a did info object, um, which is how we primarily interact with dids within Akapai. And the did mm -hmm. info object is composed of the did uh, a method identifier um, uh, and a ver key, which is you know having a a one to one mapping between did and a key is an overly simplistic view of the keys that are ultimately associated with the did. Um, and we use this very key as a stand-in for looking up the key material associated with the did as well, which again, a one-to-one -one mapping between those things is a little simplistic. So uh, there's not a way to have the same did pointed to by multiple very keys? 
so there's there's separate key info objects as well, which um have uh we can associate metadata with them, we can stick tags on them. Um so in the didcom v2 initial implementation that we did, we've we've uh tagged keys with the verification method ID. So they have a a you know they can be looked up by the did and and fragment that identifies the key. Um but it's not like a, it's not quite a complete solution. It was enough to fix our 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 needs within the Didcom v two implementation. But I think it could be taken further, uh, to make our our reasoning and usage of of dids and identifying key material, uh, to like be done to be like more did and did document native. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this, um, this is great. And the, the ver key is like comes from the ED25519 yeah, public yeah. key 2018. Essentially, and so it's the public key. Yeah. yeah right. So what I, what I would like to see is to replace this with a multi-key, right? I, I think uh, multi-key is yeah. a lot more flexible uh, and you can easily create a did key from a multi-key, right? You just had did key before it and that's it. Um, yeah. So the, I think this is a, a great improvement. And I also agree that uh, depending on the type of did you're registering, um, you know, the relationship between d dids and key pair uh, is interesting. When you register a did key, you're only going to get one key pair, right? That's just the way it is. But yeah. did web and trust did web, like the did itself, um, you know, it should be, it shouldn't be strongly tied to one key pair. It should be, like what you register as a did web should be a key ID. And that's what's registered exactly. in Agapi. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this concept of looking by dids and you get one did and one public key um, it doesn't really sit well with did web. It's kind of a bit strange uh, because really it's the verification method of your did web that you would exactly. want to store. Yeah. Um, I mean, it really depends on what you're getting from the sending party, right? Sending party could say just a did, in which case you have to figure out which did, which key within the did they mean. They could be sending a public key reference, which is the, you know, sending the ver key, in which case yeah. you got to find the did <laughs> that the ver key is in. <laughs> and but then this... the last is what you talked about, which is a verification method within a did. So they're, a uh, 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 reference within a did doc. Yeah, there, so, there could be like for, for did where there could be like the primary key, like the same way right now, like you can have many did solve and make one of them your public did. Like for a did web yeah. that you register, you can have like the default key. And that also highlights like an issue that someone had, which was to create a holder presentation through a didcom exchange um, to select which key you want to use based on the did web is not, really uh that convenient for the moment so yeah uh, for did tdw or did well i'm going to use them and interchangeably i think we know what we're, we're talking about and um but yeah having like a primary verification method for this specifically did web that would you know default to uh, as well as having the ability to refer them to like specific verification method id uh would be would be great yeah yeah okay so i, I have i have a, a, a maybe a twist on some of those ideas just expressed that i think might tie into my proposal for for having the features being declared for a did um that might make it a little clearer what we want to do when we we provide a did and tell it to do an operation um so it, I think most of the time what we want is to just be able to specify a did and then have it do something. Um, and the exact key material that we use is generally not super important unless it's been specifically identified to us by the other side. For mm -hmm. instance, when we're verifying uh, yeah. a, a presentation, like we have the specific verification method ID that signs the presentation and we're validating, we're verifying against that specific key. But yeah. if we have a credential to be issued and we want to sign that credential, uh, I think we just want to hand over the did to Akapai and say, 
sign it with this did. Yeah. Um, so I think we need a, a clear way for us to determine which verification method associated with a did should be used for that purpose. And I think it's actually generally pretty unambiguous because of what we're doing, uh, like what operate operation is being performed. So if we're yeah. signing a credential, we're going to use a verification method that's been specified in the assertion method verification relationship. Yeah. Um, and then if there's multiple in there, we would uh, select the first one that matches the the proof Perfect. type that was uh, requested. So yeah. if, they, if they wanted like a ES-256 signature, then we would select the P-256 verification method and not the ED-25519 verification method, yeah. even though they're both inside of the assertion method list. Um, yeah. So as long as Akapai has, has a say in how the did document is constructed, we can deterministically say these are the keys that are going to be used for these purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and we no longer have a need, I think, to specifically bind like a singular key as the quote unquote primary key um, for the did. We we just have we have our verification relationships and we have a set of, of keys um in there and and like yeah, the 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 usage of them is pretty clearly defined by their verification re relationship. Yeah. That's interesting. I think uh, I like that a lot. I still think it's very important to enable someone to be able to say which verification method they want to sign with. Yeah. There are going to be use cases where they might need a specific one, and there could be like two verification methods that use the same key type, right? That could be very possible. Uh, and I think it should be some sort of logic that if they say which one it is, well, it's going to use that one. If they don't say, then it, it finds yeah. uh, which one to use based on something like you described or yeah. either like this sort of discovery model or just a, a default yeah. one to use. And I think that makes sense. And I think it's it's pretty straightforward for us to implement the ability to explicitly point which verification method you want to use as opposed to defaulting to one yeah, based on the, verification relationship. So I, I think yeah. that's pretty straightforward. I, I do contend, I contest the idea that people will need to use a very specific verification method ID in the general case, um, mm. because most controllers, they just want the did and they just want to do what they want to do with the did. They don't really care necessarily about like specifically which keys are being used. Um, uh, yeah, I, I would say that maybe the, I, I know a few use cases, but yeah, I think. Yeah, there might be power user use cases. And I, and I agree using the verification method idea as a way to unambiguously specify is is Well, as valid, you get but, more yeah. into production use case where you're interacting with other people that expect something things is when you'll need these sort of features. Uh, if you're interacting with another party uh, that expects you know, maybe they, they know this verification method from you and they need it, uh, then you want to uh, use this. And uh, another thing is that a verification method ID uh, can be used in a very similar way that a credential definition ID is used, meaning if a credential is issued with a specific key, um, this can be requested by a verifier. You know, I want you to show me a credential that's signed with this very specific uh, or issue me a credential with this specific verification method ID. That's like a use case I could foresee. Um, yeah. I, I think all of these things, if I'm, if I've got right, are at the, oh, sorry, Colton, your hands up. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to mention, uh, so that throughout this conversation, one of the things that sprung to mind is that you can go ahead and use a uh, did web in particular. Um, it's, it would not be common for a did peer, or but it would be for did web or did TDW, where multiple services are using the same did. So you might have Akapai using the same exact did as what the corporate uh, Blue Sky account is using because Blue Sky allows you uh, their default for users is uh, did PLC, but if you're creating like say a bot account or whatnot, 
they allow you to create a did web and post, uh, you know, the keys on there. And so I could see a combination of all of a corporate entity or a government agency's dids all in the same did doc for a bunch of different services. And it's all like which one you end up using is dictated by, say, for example, when you're trying to communicate to them, the services block says, oh, we, we support this protocol or whatnot. Yeah. So, and I think all of this conversation, including what Colton just said, what Daniel and Patrick were saying is, these are all in the context of after you, but are independent of did TDW. These are just did handling things. Am I am I correct there that you would say? Yeah. Um, yeah. Did handling yeah. or how you well, use your did with yeah. who? Yeah, like um, you would have a, you would receive a reference to a did or a ver key or a or a did reference in something inbound from somebody, and you would have to resolve it somehow, resolve the did. Either you have the did already, and it's a ver key, so you would have to find the did, or if it's a did reference, oh, I don't have that did yet, you've got to go resolve it. But then all of this handling would be after you've resolved it, correct? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it's interesting, like, how, when you think about how Akapai handles the TDW to decide which features belong to Akapai and which features belong to exactly. a controller, Exactly. Uh, because I think what's very important is that Akapai enables a controller to conduct the business they need. So it needs to be somewhat flexible and not make too many opinions on how things should happen. Uh, but it should, you know, enable a few different ways if it makes sense. Like sometimes enabling too many features is, is a bad idea. But yeah. for selecting which did you want to sign a document with, I think that's definitely something that should be... Uh, supported by Akapai and then the controller yeah. makes that decision of how, you know, how they communicate that. Yeah. And the relevance of all this is because as we implement the TDW, we want to make sure these concepts get in there. Am I reading that right, Daniel? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. These are, okay. these are things that apply universally across all of our, our yeah. across all did methods. Um, and, and something that we've like, we've taken, you know, overly simplistic or, or shortcuts um, to this exactly. point with our, our did handling. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Good context. Okay. Uh, I think that's all we have time for. Um, I believe, yeah, we're just about up. So um, I think we'll go with that for as a wrap for today. Any other comments or any other follow up that people want to say at the last? Um. Something that I I like, uh, and this comes back to this uh, publishing an item to a, a trusted web server, is that before you post an item, you make a request from the server as a placeholder for the location when you want to post that file, and the server would return you proof options that you then you need to use to apply the proof on that document you want to send. Okay. Um, for a did document, that's pretty straightforward. So my, the way I did it is you do a get request on the location where you want your did to be. And then the server would A, tell you it's not available or B, return you a sort of empty did doc template uh, with a proof configuration that oh, they want you to use. And then it's your job to then register that did and add a verification method to that the empty did that template and then sign it with that new verification method you requested and then get another signature from an endorser. And part of this proof configuration can add like something like a challenge and a domain and maybe a like a created and expired, like a time lapse in which you need to return your 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 document. Um and okay, then I you can just... tell we have to have more discussions on this because that you went through a lot of stuff there. Yeah. So, and, and, yeah. Um, I, Daniel, Jamie, Patrick, uh, I would at least at least like to pull you into some meetings on this um, to figure out what we're doing because if it if these are 
tied together. We have to figure, we got to have more meetings to figure out exactly what we're doing. Yeah. And I'd like to, Andrew, if he could be part and uh, okay. I don't know if that makes sense because I'm assuming that Akapai will use the trusted web Python implementation for the code. Yes. Like yeah. it won't okay. be right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, I will take that as an action to get us some time. If anyone wants to be part of those discussions, let me know. Those are the people that I know. Jamie's going to be working on this from a BC Gov perspective. Daniel's got a lot of knowledge there. Patrick's doing a lot from um, <clears throat> another part of BC Gov um, and other work he's doing. So that's where those names come up for me. If anyone else wants to be part of that, let me know. Glad to include you in any. And of course, we'll bring this back to Acapug in the next uh, at the next meeting as well. Okay, thanks all. Have a great day after Labor Day. Thank you. Bye.